The Lost Frost Girl by Amy Wilson. Chapter 9. Normally when I'm feeling down, I listen to some music, do a bit of drawing, or talk to Mallory. But none of that's working tonight. I avoided Mom when I got in, just called hello upstairs, and came into my room. The idea was to do some sketching. I lose myself in that, but I'm too agitated. Can't settle. The owls I'm drawing are all lopsided and weird looking. And honestly, I'm a bit fed up with owls right now. Mallory's having her family evening, so she's unavailable. That's probably lucky, actually, since all I do is moan and then feel bad about moaning. Owl! Mom's voice interrupts my thoughts. Come, my love! I've made us some lovely doll. Doll is lentils. I cannot tell you how much I loathe lentils. Mom dresses them up in all sorts of guises. Lentil lasagna, lentil stew, lentil and muffins. They're a special kind of horror. And, of course, the doll. It doesn't matter how many times I tell her I don't like them. She just keeps on making things with them in her own special way. It's as if she thinks one day I'll turn around and say, You know what, Mom? I was wrong all along. Aren't these lentils incredible? I am never going to say that. I push my chair back from my desk and storm to the kitchen. We have a small apartment. My room, Mom's room, sitting room, kitchen, bathroom. The studio in the attic. Anyway, it doesn't take me long to get to the kitchen. She's dishing up the doll. It's dark out now, and she's lit tea lights all along the kitchen counters and on the table. Why don't we have a family evenings and order pizza and ice cream and talk about how my day was at school? Mom turns to me. She's wearing small gold hoop earrings, and they glint as she moves. Family evenings? Yes, special ones. When you make an effort to find out what's going on with me, but I already know what's going on with you, Owl. Every evening is family evening. Family is all the parts, not just some of the parts. I'm too cross. It's not coming out right. I take a deep breath, leaning against the wall as she puts plates on the table. She's made non bread and raita to go with the lentils. And my stomach rumbles treacherously. Family is this. She gestures around the room. Family is wherever there is home and food and love. Come now, come and eat, and we'll talk. But it's not here, she said, reaching into your favorite. I got your favorite. Mexicana spicy cheese. She smiles hopefully, and my eyes sting. I don't want cheese, but you love it. I don't want any of this. I want to know who my father is. I fold my arms and glare at her. Owl, I need to know. She puts her back up against the kitchen counter. I've told you the story. I used to read it to you. Don't you remember? I told you how I met him. How beautiful. His name, Mom. Tell me his actual, proper name name. All the color seems to drain from her face as she stares at me and realizes I'm not going to give in this time. My breath catches in my throat and suddenly I feel sick. I wish I hadn't stormed in here. I should have let it go. I'm not going to like it. I can tell from the way she twists her hands that she's scared. Just do it, I whisper. How can it be that bad? Jack, she says, looking me in the eye. His name is Jack. Jack what? Jack Frost. Laughing. Crying. She's rushing over to me. I fight her off. Can't breathe. Is my life such a joke to her? Is she crazy? Does she really believe what she's saying? Her eyes are shining with the truth of it. But how? How can that be true? Chapter 10 the world of winter. 
It was a day. It could have been a week or a month or longer. It could have been a lifetime. The days in the place did not work the same, and she was lost in magic that surrounded her so that if it had been forever, she would never have questioned it. The light was low and bright when it broke through the haze. The mountains towered above her, and there were living creatures there, goats tripping over rocks, and eagles high overhead. A frozen lake opened out to the west of the dome, and she was sure it had never been anything other than ice upon ice. The dome was his palace, wrought of ice that fractured and splintered light upon shining blue-white floors. There were staircases that led nowhere, and others that swept up to new chambers. Over all was the frozen ceiling, covered in a layer of snow, and where he lit candles, she, the light glanced off a million chiseled surfaces, making fractural shapes upon the floor. There was danger all around them in that place, and she knew when she looked into his silver eyes that he could be just as terrible as any of the wolves and just as treacherous as the ice. What are you? he asked her. How do you appear here now? Chapter 11 I'm in my room, my stomach still churning, eyes stinging. I had to get away from Mom because it can't be true. It can't be. It's ridiculous, impossible, plain, wrong. I'm shouting the words inside my head to drown out the other thoughts, but they filter through anyway because she told me, didn't she, over the years, in all those moon-eyed stories of a winter wonderland, wild and beautiful. And I always knew deep down that my father was not going to be your usual sort of person, mom being who she is. And then there are the things that have happened since the first frost fell two days ago. It shouldn't be a big surprise. My father is an icon of winter, a spirit who spreads frost across the world. No need to overact, overreact, Owl. You knew it was going to be something freaky, I tell myself, catching sight of my face in the mirror. There's a full moon tonight, and my reflection is a warped glimpse of a new me, someone I suddenly barely know. Pale skin, pale hair, golden eyes, it's me. It just all looks so different now. The edges seem to blur, and I could almost imagine the girl in the mirror is some sort of fairy tale creature, proportions all slightly off, somehow, skin glowing with a strange silver sheen. What am I? Something pulls at me deep inside, a fear I never knew about. What if Mom is right, and Jack Frost, the figure she made so familiar with all her tales, is my father? What would that really mean? Tears gather in my eyes, and when I blink, they fall into my lap, with a gleam in the moonlight, three tiny drops of ice. Owl, let me in! No! I brush the tears away, relieved when they melt at the touch of my hand. Please, let's talk about it! Mom opens the door and lingers there, one hand on the knob. I thought you were ready, she says softly. I thought the stories I told you when you were little might have helped that you would somehow understand. Isn't it better to know? No, I say. And I mean to, mean to be brave and turn away from her and not show her my new, uncertain self. But my voice wobbles, and I find myself looking at her while more tears fall, and I don't mean to let them. I brush them away as soon as I can, but she sees. She sees everything. Oh, owl! I don't know what to do. What is this? Why am I so different? It's all right, my love. She breathes, pressing over to sit beside me on the old bedspread she made with my baby clothes. She puts her arms around me. You are wonderful. You have always been my wonderful, special girl. She pulls away and looks at me, her eyes bright. It is more evident now. Then it is not a bad thing, Owl. She says fiercely, you are becoming what you were always meant to be. I have often wondered, and now winter has come, and you're at the age where your body is changing, but not like this. Look! I howl as the tears of ice keep on falling, 
They're beautiful. Oh, Mom. I swipe them away angrily, clench my jaw to stop more from coming. You always say that sort of thing, but they're not. They're not supposed to be doing that. What am I going to do? How am I going to go to school? What will I tell people? You're upset, she says, but that won't last forever. And truthfully, I don't know what's going to happen. Owl, and I understand, I understand that to be different is difficult, but you will be all right. Have I not always embraced the part of you that is only you? What do you know about being different? I demand pulling away. I mean, really. When did you last cry tears of ice or half freeze your best friend with a touch? How do you know what it feels like? Owl, you can't make this better. I'm not convinced it should be better, she says, looking out into the night, her dark eyes glittering. But if you think there's someone who can help you more, perhaps you should seek him out. I suppose you could. You mean him? I could never find him again, she says, her voice hushed. But you're different, as you say. You're part of that world I told you stories about, Owl. Come. I'll show you where it all begins. It's an enormous book, covered in black leather, tucked into the bottom corner of the vast bookshelf that dwarfs the rest of the little sitting room. I recognize it immediately as the one Mom read from when I was a kid. The gold writing on the cover says, Fableth and Earth Spirit, how to meet them, and how to find your way to your own spirit self. This, she says, leafing through the dry yellowed pages, pulling me on the settee and switching on the overhead lamp. She peers at me over the top of the book, her eyes twinkling. I think she's enjoying this. It's almost like she's been waiting for it to happen. I scowl at her. Well, she says, turning back to the book, this is what took me to him. I was reading through it, thinking of all these places or what it would be like if they were real. I was searching for something, adventure, I suppose, when they read out the incantation. She shakes her head, a funny little smile on her mouth. Well, I didn't think it would work, but it did. Oh, it did, she says. All the stories I told you, Owl, some of them were my own. The place I found myself, it was real. I woke up in the morning, and I didn't know how real it was until I discovered I was carrying you. They were her own stories, not fables at all. And you think I should try this? I ask. She bites her lip. Honestly, I don't think you're ready. I think you need to find yourself before you can seek answers from others. But she waves off my protest. But it's up to you. How can I tell you what to do? or what not to do in this situation. There has never been anyone like you, Owl. You're more than most. Need to find your own way. Oh, just give me the book. I say, taking it and hefting it back to my room. Be careful, my love, she calls after me. Please, be careful. I will, I shout. Dropping the book on my bed, I'm shaking, almost numb with exhaustion. I close the curtains and climb into bed pulling the covers up and heaving the book onto my lap. I want to talk to Mallory. I look at the clock, 11. It's still the same evening, the same day, just a few hours since I saw her, even less since everything changed. She'd know what to say. I fumble for my phone, no texts, no missed calls, and she had her family evening. I put the phone on the bookcase next to my bed. It can wait, honestly. What would I even say right now? Incantation, I mutter, opening the book and turning to the index at the back. It must be truly ancient. Every single S is written as an F. Some of my favorite stories aren't there, I realize as I flick through the pages. Of course, because Mom made them up. They were her experiences of when she went to that other place and met him, my father. Let's do this then, I say shaking my head as I find a poem that
that looks a bit like some sort of spell. Ridiculous book. Chapter 12. Mallory isn't telling me something. I mean, I'm not telling her something either. But whereas I'm trying to be normal while the name Jack Frost rattles in the back of my head, she's all bug-eyed and quiet, shuffling along to school, making absolutely no effort to be normal, and she can't possibly have a Jack Frost situation of her own going on. Mel, I say in the end, after the fifth conversation I've opened, gets shut in my face. What's wrong? I don't want to talk about it, she says, shaking her head. But wait, look. I pull at her arm. Maybe I can help. No, you can't. Mallory, I just can't. I want to get through the day without thinking about it all. Can we do that? Yeah, I know. Of course, I, of course we can, I say. Just, you know, whenever you want to talk. Yeah, I know, she says, hitching her bag up onto her shoulder as we reach the main gates. Did you talk to your mom? Uh, sort of, I say. And just another bunch of nonsense, I sigh, brushing aside lingering thoughts of frozen tears and fathers with ice-tipped hair and failed attempts to find my spirit felf with that silly old book. So let's both get through the day, and maybe we could do something this evening. Her face shuts down. Can't. Okay. I mutter behind her back as she storms off into school. Man, that is unlike Mallory. What the heck happened last night? I thought my evening was bad. I try to catch up with her, but she's streaming through the crowds of kids, and she's got a very neat way of doing it. I have bigger feet or something. I just don't slink as easily. She had her family evening. I remember as we get into homeroom. That must be it. Maybe they nagged about homework, or maybe they didn't like the bees she got in math last week. I look at her sideways. She's all hunched, pale, playing absently with the zip on her pencil case. Something big has happened. Mallory's pretty tough with all the usual stuff. Maybe, maybe they want to move? Mal, I whisper. Mal, are you moving? What? She looks up, panic all over her face. You're not moving, are you? And right there, in the middle of homeroom, my ever bubbly, sensible best friend starts to cry. Mallory! God, Owl, why can't you just leave it alone? She whispers, swiping tears from her cheeks and bending down to her bag, pulling a tissue from the great wad of them she's got in there. I told you, I just wanted to get through. I'm sorry, I was worried. They're doing a trial separation, she says, keeping her head bent as others filter into the classroom. Connor starts to make his way over, a look on his face as though he's about to prank and wind us up, and I shake my head, giving him a good strong glare, which is enough to make him frown and mouth things at me instead. I ignore him and pretend I didn't notice Avery coming in at all, though part of me is treacherously aware of him all the same time. All the fighting. They say it's not fair on me. They want to have a break from each other. Mallory continues. I shuffle closer, putting my arm against hers. Oh, Mallory. He was packing when I left. He's going to stay with my uncle for a few weeks. She puts her head in her hands, and I don't know what to say. I just sit there, right up close to her, so she knows I'm here. And then Mr. Varley comes in and starts shouting about people walking in late and scruffy. And it's probably the most normal thing about the day so far. So it's actually quite a welcome sound.